when I first got my license, everything was, you know, really pretty cool. It was my first car. It was something I get to do finally. You know, I get to be responsible for myself. Something I'd been looking forward to for probably 16 years, I guess. Or since I was old enough to, to know, you know, that I was going to get to drive. In the car, when you're talking to your friends and you're laughing and you're singing a song and stuff, you're not paying attention to what's exactly going on or how fast you're going in the car. Yeah, you know, teenagers don't have rules, you know? I mean, you have rules at home. You have rules in your parents' car. You don't have rules in a teenager's car. Not at all. <laughs> We were playing around, of course, you know. I, I mostly was on the road, but you know how kids are. You know, of course, you look in the rear view mirror, seeing what everyone's doing in the back seat. They were just average kids. I mean, Greg had driven two years and never had a ticket and never had an accident. <laughs> they drove a little fast, but who, you know, what kids don't. I got in the car to go to school because I got picked up from Ashley every day. Me and Natasha argued over who was going to sit in the front seat and. She won the argument, of course. It was my friend's 21st birthday, and I was, you know, just having a few with him. It started out just to be a normal morning. The, they usually took off for work about the time I went outside on the farm and started chores and things, and they were just joking around in the morning, and it was a cold winter morning, and roads were good, really didn't think anything about it. She re reached over with her left hand to grab something out of the, the center console, and when she reached over, it kind of just swerved the car a little, and we were going about 65 miles per hour, and the speed limit was actually 45. I was driving, and we, it was, I think, at like 1 o'clock in the morning, and we were heading home. We were doing 90-plus uh, mile an hour around a, a curve, and... Uh, when we flew straight off that curve and into an embankment, and it was pretty deep. Um, hit head on, and uh, th that was where it stopped, you know. Uh, it pushed the whole front end of the truck back on us. Police had said it looked like, for some reason, Greg had gotten a little off the edge of the road. When he pulled back on, he overcorrected and spun around sideways, and then went through the ditch and the driver's door hit the power pole. And they estimated he was going 79 when he lost control and probably hit the pole around 50 miles an hour or so. We had to drive by it in order to get to the hospital. Uh, we, we just knew that our, our whole reality had changed and, and as bad as the accident looked, you know, we didn't know if we had any sons left. We knew that Greg couldn't have survived, and we just prayed that Steve was able to come out. There were four people in the back seat, and one in the passenger. It was just us six going out for a good time. It was actually three couples. Next thing I know, I do see a hand pulled in, pulling the steering wheel. And, you know, the first time I could correct it, you know, the second time he pulled again and the car went into a slide where I couldn't, I couldn't get out of the slide. It just went sideways and right into a tree. And the next thing I know, I wake up, looking around, not knowing what's going on. You know, there's dust everywhere. And I see Robbie next to me and two guys run into the car asking if we're okay. And I'm just like, what just happened? When it hit this tree, it wrapped around it. And as the back end went around it, you just, three of my friends went out the back window. There was uh, Jenny, and then Jesse, and then Tosh in the far back. And there was Lester trapped inside the car still. And that's when it like hit me like, whoa, they're not just, you know, unconscious, you know, they're, they're dead. The car um, actually spun for about 200 feet, and then it hit the light pole. No, an emergency jump. <laughs> yeah, there was just an accident on the hill right before it's flown. Uh, is that flown? I think it's the phone flown. Um, it's really bad. It's really bad. Are you okay? I wasn't in the accident. I just saw it. This is all my friends. And then oh, all of them were. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What are you seeing? Oh, my God. What are you seeing? Oh, my God. 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 O
I remember hitting the pole and then like open my eyes and there was just a bunch of metal everywhere really. When the car hit the pole, it actually split in half. The front of it went about 50 feet down the road, I believe. I couldn't see anything from my waist down and then I looked up in the front seat and the hardest part about it was that my two best friends, the girls I went everywhere with every day, the ones that I just hung out with and spent, like, shared my life with, they were both just bleeding. And the driver, she had um, hit her head on the steering wheel, I believe, and there was blood and brains coming out of her head. And Natasha, the passenger, she was died on impact. When I heard them say there's been a fatality, and then I saw them pull a sheet over her body in the road, I didn't want to see what they were, I didn't want to know that. After an hour and a half, they grabbed under my arms, and they started to pull. And I started screaming because I felt this swishing pain. And when they put me on the stretcher, when they finally got me out of the car, I heard him say, we ought to find her foot. I lost consciousness, my heart stopped. I died for about three minutes on the helicopter. I woke up in the hospital and didn't know why I was there or anything, I guess because of my head injuries. And, um, you know, they told me that I was driving and, and um, I was going too fast around a corner and that my blood alcohol level was 0.07. Um, at that time, 0 0.08 was the legal limit. So I wasn't actually considered, you know, a DWI, but uh, I was definitely intoxicated. My friend lost his life in the accident. I was actually in the hospital through my friend's funeral. I didn't even get, you know, wasn't allowed to go, you know. I actually um, have broke like every bone in my face. I've got a pin holding uh, my cheek in there. I don't have a real cheekbone. Uh, I've got uh, two plates and screws all down through my jaws and um, screws in my arm, hold my arm together, it was broke. We stayed down at the hospital for a week or 10 days because Steve was in such critical condition and, and moment to moment. And then we were also dealing with the fact that we had a funeral to plan. And um, it, it, was, it was an incredibly impossible situation. Um, really hard. When we left the rehab hospital, they basically told us Steve will probably never walk again, never talk, never be able to eat. Um, he was on a feeding tube and, you know, the best prognosis wasn't very good. I had to go to court and I had to testify. The first time I testified against him was to prove that I was innocent and he, well, to prove that he was guilty of pulling the steering wheel. He got jail time. Um, juvenile, which I think it was up to two years for each account, which was four accounts, four kids that died. For me, uh, as a result of the accident, I got two years of my license suspended, um, 250 hours of community service, and probation. And that was just for a speeding ticket. I remember waking, waking up in the hospital, and my mom was right there, and um, I had already gotten, I mean, I think they said nine surgeries. I had already gotten my leg amputated. Um, they found my left, I mean, they reattached my left foot. I was crushed from the waist down, every bone, my spine, my pelvis, my hips, my legs were all crushed into pieces and I was never supposed to walk again. I, sh I, I mean, I shouldn't even be here. It's a miracle that I lived through that. I was charged with uh, uh, involuntary manslaughter in the first degree, and I got charged with two counts of second degree assault, which are all three class C felonies, 
When I started going to court over it all, I was actually facing 21 years in penitentiary. Can I help you? Uh, yeah, I need to come in for the weekend. I got locked up in uh, the county jail for about six months. And then when it finally all came together so we knew what was going to happen, uh, I ended up uh, doing two years worth of weekends in the county jail. Put your wrist right in there. We'll book you in just a minute. You got four walls there. It's not something to look forward to. Uh, you know, a lot of people are like, oh man, it's the weekend, you know. I dread mine. It's hard, and, but I think Steve's stubbornness and endurance, and he had his mindset that he was going to recover, and he did. I remember not being able to talk that was frustrating. I should not say slow down. Especially when I go to grave sites, you know, I get down on my knees and I say that I love them. I miss them very much. Um, life is a lot different without them. I, I have not talked to any of their parents since the day of the accident. They have not, they don't want anything to do with me. I know they think that I'm responsible. They think me and my boyfriend were both responsible. They, um, and they figure, you know, I was the driver of the car, so I should be able to control everything that happened in the car. And they, they just believe it was all my fault. I had a, a lot of fun and I knew every day when I woke up that I'd be with my best friends and we'd be having a good time. And it was something to look forward to every day. Never thought it would be taken away from me like that. Everything was normal, fine. We was, we was partying, having fun. And, and then that one night, it just it happened. Just knowing that, uh, that my best friend lost his life because of me, uh, that's, it's, I, I don't even have a word to, to tell you how, how bad that feels. Uh, it's hard to live with yourself. Greg thought he was a good driver. He was very confident, um, and he was, for his age, a good driver. But all it takes is one mistake. It was just a normal teenage day, you know? To me, that's all it was. Um, and I believe people do see me as maybe a bad person or, you know, not smart for, you know, having four people in my back seat. But, you know, a 16-year-old is a 16-year-old. I loved life. I mean, I still do. But I loved my best friends more than anything in the world. I mean, they were my life. And I could, it's so hard to explain to other teenagers right now like this. Like, they'll watch this and they'll be like, you know, I feel bad, you know? I don't want them to feel bad for me. I just want them to know that it can happen. To anyone, it doesn't. It doesn't matter who you are. You know how much money you have, or how much fun you have in high school. It can happen to you, and you could lose the most important people in your life. There are so many stories like these. In fact, you probably know someone who's been through something like this. Auto accidents are the leading cause of teenage deaths. But there are some simple things you can do to cut down on your chances of being involved in crashes like these. I know you've heard it before, but wear your seatbelt and slow down. Most of these crashes could have been avoided if the drivers were doing the speed limit. Also, as Sarah pointed out, keep control of your car. 
Don't have too many passengers and don't let them goof around while you're trying to drive. And stay focused on the road. Don't try and do other things while you're driving. Whether you're getting something out of your console, playing with the radio, or trying to make a call, it just takes a second to lose focus. Try and give yourself plenty of time to react if something happens in front of you. Follow the two second rule. When the car ahead of you passes a stripe on the road or something that's not moving, you should be able to count to two before you pass the same object. Finally, don't put yourself in a bad situation. You know you're not supposed to drink and drive, but bad weather, congested traffic, and lack of sleep can cause problems too. In fact, most teen crashes happen at night. Just try and avoid these situations if you can. You already know you're supposed to do most of these things, but as you've seen, all it takes is one mistake. Take care and be safe out there.